Hey there and welcome back. I hope you're doing well this wonderful Monday afternoon. Um, this is another live stream for Drawing One, Art 103 at Clark College. I'm Professor Grant Hoddle and today I'm going to be talking about drawing in ink washers. Now this is a live stream so if you're watching live feel free to ask me anything in the comments section. I'll do my best to answer your questions as I go. If you're watching it uh, recorded at a later date then um, of course you'll have to ask me questions via email. Um, the point of to this week's project is to loosen you guys up a little bit, um, introduce a new and difficult technique and uh, material, that being ink. I had you purchase in your kit some bamboo brushes and some Sumi ink. That's what I'll be drawing with today. Um, you can see in the um, description of this video the materials that I'm specifically using today. But I will also show them to you right now. So what I'm going to be using, first of all, is my paper. This is a uh, 140 uh, pound cold press Canson watercolor paper. You can hear it's pretty thick. That will allow it to hold up to a wet media really easily. Um, you are probably using your drawing pad uh, and that's not gonna be as strong. It's gonna be something like 80 pound and not um, designed for wet media. So it's gonna wrinkle a lot more and that's okay. I'm not gonna get mad at you for that. That's part of the project as far as this is concerned. If you do have some watercolor paper, um, maybe you took uh, Professor Ben Rosenberg's watercolor class and you have some left over, or you have some thick um, uh, Bristol paper from a 2D design class, something like that, you might consider using that in lieu of your drawing paper. This stuff will also hold up better. Uh, now this is, as I said, cold press. Um, that means that it has a little bit of stippling. This has a fine tooth. Um, it's going to be impossible to see on this camera, but there's a little bit of texture to it. Um, now, the amount of texture that's available in a given watercolor paper is entirely dependent on the tooth that, of the, the paper maker uh, that they decided to give it. But generally speaking, cold press like this has a higher raised tooth than hot press. Hot press tends to be steamed flat and it has a lot slicker surface. I like to use both for different things. Uh, if you like working in watercolor and ink, you might play around with different methods until you figure out what to use. So that's my paper, Canson Cold Press. As far as brushes go, I have a set here, uh, a few different ones that I'm gonna be using. Um, I also use paper towels. Uh, you're gonna need paper towels. I have several ready to go. Um, this is for a lot of things. You'll, I'll talk about it again later, but you'll need some paper towels. Um, I have, this is a number four round. Round brushes are basically, you know, your standard issue brush. Uh, probably looks like what you imagine a paintbrush to look like. That's a number four. Here's another number four. I like to keep a couple of them in case I have one being dark and one being light. Here's a number uh, eight. Uh, you can tell it's about twice as thick. And uh, so this will be used for applying quite a bit more water than the first two. And then I have a couple of flats to use. Flats are exactly like they sound like. This is a number 10 flat. And this is a number 12 flat. These will be for applying a lot more water, maybe getting a little bit of a blend and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of ink, what I'll be using is Sumi ink, very similar to what you bought. Uh, what I'm using is Yasutomo Black. Uh, I like Sumi ink a lot. It tends to be quite warm compared to Indie ink, which can be kind of variable. Um, when it comes to Sumi, I think this is a really good brand, but there's a lot of great ones out there. Yasutomo is a good uh, ink. Sumi ink is uh, traditionally a Japanese ink and works great. If you like comics and illustration, you might consider using some um, ink by Speedball. I really like Speedball Super Black. Uh, anytime I'm inking comic pages, this is usually what I use. Um, but I won't be using it today because I had you buy Sumi ink, so I'll be using Sumi ink as well. Now you can, of course, also use pens and markers. Uh, really great sets out there available in a lot of different sizes and so on and so forth that can give you a lot of different methods of control. Um, I also particularly like ink uh, brush pens like this one by... Um, Oh, who's this one by? Uh, I have a thing somewhere. I think it's by Prisma. Pintech, I think. I think it's a Pintech brush. And um, it's great. And you can see it has the qualities of a pen, but I mean, of a brush, but is in pen format. So this handle is full of ink and you can squeeze it and squeeze out a little bit of ink at the time. I'm not going to be drawing with any of those today, though. I'm going to be drawing with brush and ink and wash. And the reason for that is so that um, I can kind of talk through a lot of the variables of technique that you'll be using 
and um, can kind of help you see what some options are. And again, really trying to loosen up a little bit. Now, in addition to the tools that I've shown you so far today, that's that's uh, paper, paper towels, brushes, and ink. You're also going to need a few cups, uh, a few cups to you to put water and water watered down ink with. So first of all, I have just pure water here. Uh, it's a it's a messy bowl because I use it for paint too sometimes. Uh, but just clean water. Um, this one is a step darker. It looks very dark in this format, but I'll show you what it looks like in a little bit. This is a lot of water and a little bit of ink. It looks really dark when you're looking at it right in the camera, but once I make marks with it, you'll see that it's actually quite light. There's a lot of water and not as much ink, okay? Um, then I have a step darker. This has a lot more ink and a lot less water, but it's still not pure black ink. So kind of like a stepped value scale you can see there. And then finally, a little cup of pure black Sumi ink. Now this is as black as I'll be using today. Um, so this will be my jettist black. And you can kind of see the distinctions between those there. So that's what you need. Um, you need at least a cup to hold your ink and a cup to hold clean water. If you have those two, you can make a lot of adjustments um, inside your while you're working on like what you're hoping for and so on and so forth. But um, you'll have a little bit more control uh, if you have a few other um, cups set out and ready to go. Now, as far as the kind of drawing you're going to be making this week, I've asked you to pick three different objects, and and the reason for that. It's because rather than you spending a whole six hours this week on one drawing um, that has a lot of pressure built into it of like trying to make a masterpiece or whatever, um, I want you to try and practice doing this a few different times. So I asked you to pick three objects. Um, your objects should be of extreme visual interest to you. They should be visually arresting, I think is the language I used in your assignment sheet. And But you get to choose what they are. So make sure that you think through um, what stands out as really cool to you. You know, it can be something that's like a toy that means a lot to you or, um, you know, a photograph inside a frame that you want to work with. Uh, of course, uh, just an object that you think looks cool, like a, a glass a vase with water in it and a flower. That's kind of what I'm going to be working from today. But whatever it is, I want you to, tr to pick three different ones and to spend about two hours each um, practicing these methods and trying some of the different techniques that I'm going to highlight for you today. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about some of those methods that you might be using. The first and most obvious one is called wet on dry. I have dry paper. I'm going to take a brush and I'm going to dip it into something wet and then I'm going to mark it on the dry paper. That's wet on dry. It's pretty straightforward, right? So for this, let me just use some straight ink so you'll really be able to see it. Um, this might be a kind of mark making that dip into a little bit different that you kind of use your brush to do some different types of marks with. And as you work, you just kind of use the brush to keep an edge wet and to build it back across the surface. So this is wet into wet. And you can see that depending on how much water I'm using in my brush, my value is going to change dramatically. Now, for those of you who have never used a brush before, never painted, um, the first thing that you're going to notice that's very different from using graphite or charcoal is that your value in brushwork has nothing to do with how hard you press. Um, of course, in graphite and charcoal, if you press harder, you make a darker mark. In brushwork, your value is entirely determined by what you've dipped your brush into. So if you dip your brush into something very light, then you make a light mark. If you dip your brush into something darker, you make a dark mark. And of course, that can go all the way up, in this case, to our jet black. Okay, so what happens when you press hard with a brush is not that your value changes, the size of your mark changes. So if I barely touch the paper at all with the tip of this brush, and so I'm really just kind of balancing my hand against the edge of the paper and I just send a little bitty mark, I can make a quite fine line here. You see that? Now if I press significantly harder, 
I get a much thicker line and it changes the quality of, 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 of the mark as I drag it across that surface, right? So that's a big distinction. And it means that a lot of times when you're drawing, you're going to have to take a lot of care to not press too hard if you want to maintain a, a, a really precise line with your, with your brushwork. Um, so this is a wet on wet method. The next obvious choice to do is one of everybody's favorites. It was certainly one of my favorites when I first did watercolor in like third, you know, whatever, fourth grade or whenever it was that I tried it. Um, and it's called wet on wet. So what you do is you take, you need to keep your paper fairly wet for this. So I'm gonna use my bigger uh, flat brush and I'm gonna dip into straight clean water. And I'm just gonna make a, a nice kind of square space kind of puddle here keeping that pretty wet. I can barely see it. You won't be able to see it at all, I'm sure, in the um, <coughs> in the image. And then I'm gonna dip my brush back into some ink and while the paper's still wet, I'm gonna let that bleed into the surface and you can see some pretty awesome stuff happens when you do that. Let me just kind of flick a little bit too. And you can kind of see how there's like an automatic bleed that happens. Let me see if I use a little bit um, less black. So you can see how that changes as well. Um, and so because the paper is already saturated with water and is still wet, now my ink bleeds into it almost like a cloud. And in fact, it works really great for depictions of clouds uh, if, you're, if you like working that way. And you can get a lot of of variation in your wet on wets. Now, obviously this is just coating an entire section and then bleeding in wet, uh, um, wet ink on top of wet paper, but you can also do a lot of moves like this with line work. So uh, let me just do a really simple, I know a lot of you guys like to work as kind of drawing human figure type stuff. So let me just use kind of a quick method for an eye. You know, very typical kind of drawing. Now, while that's still wet, if I dip into some darker ink, I can still get that to work. And notice how the ink tends to, it don't, won't always hold it exactly right, but it tends to follow my marks I've already made, which is very cool and can give you a lot of variation in how you make the work. Okay, so that's wet on wet, wet on dry. Final one, you saw me this already start, not final one, but next one I'm gonna talk about. You saw this already start to happen and, and those of you who like Japanese art and calligraphy will have seen this a lot. This is um, called the dry brush technique. Uh, what you do is you dip your, your brush into whatever ink you want. I'm gonna use black and then I'm gonna pat some of it off on my paper towel and then I'm gonna use that dry brush to scumble across the surface of the paper and just give me a little bit of different and you can see it changes the, the drier my brush gets the more broken those lines become. This is super useful in um, uh, illustration, comic book illustration, any kinds of forms where you're trying to get a little bit of textured line. Um, and you can see that some of my ink is still quite wet. You can see it's still shiny in certain places, but the dry brush is already starting to kind of form up and you can change the direction of your brush quite a bit by, by I'm sorry, the mark making that your brush creates by changing the direction and the width of the brush that you use. So there's a lot of formations there. So dry brush, wet brush, I'm sorry, wet on, wet on dry, wet on wet, dry brush. That's what we've got so far. Um, the next one is actually a really obvious thing and that's that you've got this paper towel here. And let's say that you have gone too dark into something, you can press clean paper towel into a wet section of ink and pull quite a bit off. You don't want to scuff the paper too much because you can tear the paper while it's still wet pretty easily, but you can do some dabbing and pull a little bit off. This is really useful when you're trying to draw with some precision because uh, you, might, you might botch it um, and you'll probably see me do this a lot uh, while I actually start drawing today. So if you take something like 
oh, let's say this this eye, and I'm, I I want to put a shadow um, from the side of the eyeball from the um, eye socket and the side of the nose, and let's just say I kind of botch it a little bit and make it a little too dark. Well, while it's wet, I've got a lot of chance to come in and dab a little bit off and lighten that up. And if I wait until that sets a little bit, I can always go back in on top of it and draw again, making another set of marks and recreating a little bit of a form inside that space, including adding lines or what have you. Okay, so dabbing with your paper towel, very, very useful. The other thing that you want to, I basically, when I'm working in ink, I almost always have a paper towel in my, I'm, I'm right-handed, so I'm drawing with my right. I keep a paper towel basically in my left or just off the page. And that's mostly just to control the amount of fluid that's on my brush. So I've just dipped into my medium dark. Before I ever touch the paper, the first thing I'm gonna do is just dab a little of that off. And then I have a lot more control over what I'm doing with that because I've taken a little bit of the wet off the edge before I ever touch it to paper, okay? So this is gonna be something that you just kinda of have to do as you work pretty regularly. So the final thing that I wanna talk about today is um, some really common ways of mark making that you use with pen all the time. And we've used some with charcoal and graphite as well. The first one, of course, is hatching. That's where you take um, a singular line and you double it back up across itself, so something like this. You go in one direction, this is a hatch mark, and it can function as a value when you think about it across a form. And then of course you can go back across that surface with a cross hatch by creating a little gridded space. And of course that can change many times to get darker as you go, to think in terms of shades of, of gray. Uh, by working that across. So if you use straight lines, this is called a hatcher and then a cross hatch if you go back across it. The next one, many of you have used before, is called stippling. Stippling is where you just use small dots to create a sense of light and dark. And you can create, you can get a lot of distance out of that stippling by, you know, really kind of tucking all those dots really tightly together to make a heavily dark area. and then drag them further apart to make a lighter surface that kind of disappears as you move away from it, allowing more white of the paper to show through, therefore implying more light into your surface. So hatching and cross hatching, stippling. The last one is called scumbling. Scumbling is basically like if you just made marks that were different. Um, it can sometimes mean scumbling across the surface of the paper, like with a dry brush, but a lot of times people refer to it if you're just kind of making little scribbles to create your darks. But other than that, it's just like hatching and stippling in that the tighter your marks get together, the darker the representation of value is, and the further apart that they get, the lighter the representation of value is. Now, if you're scumbling, I think it's important to try and maintain a sense of randomness to your mark making so that they're, they don't feel just kind of like circular scribbles over and over again. You kind of want them to have, if you're going to all this trouble, you kind of want them to have some, some life of their own, okay? So just really quick, let me grab a, a pen here. I'll jot those down for you with a freeze frame. So we have scumbling. We have crosshatch, and we have stippling, okay? And we also have wet on wet, wet on dry, dry brush. Those are the main ones that you're gonna run into. Now I also ta you know, dabbed out with my uh, paper towel and I wanna show you one more that I really love. 
This is a move that I learned from a good friend of mine named Preston Graves, who's a uh, fantastic ink artist uh, in Seattle. He worked in ink and paint. Um, and uh, he was the first guy I ever saw do this, but uh, it's a regular practice by a lot of watercolorists. You get a wet series of marks somewhere on your drawing. And while it's still wet, you take a spray bottle and you miss that sucker. And it does all kinds of crazy things where that blasts in. So of course, you're probably gonna need a paper towel to keep kind of track of things and come back in and touch, kind of control where that extra water is going and try and do your best to maintain a sense of control over a fairly uncontrollable surface. And that's one of the things I really want you guys to have some fun with as you work today and this whole week is trying to control the uncontrollable. I mean, that's essentially what I'm asking you to do with this uh, project is I want you to um, use ink and drawing and have fun and try and get a representation of whatever your objects are. But I also want you to experiment. All of your um, sketchbook prompts this week are based on experimenting off things just like what I did here today. I want you to try them out. I want you to do that first before you start on your bigger project and have some fun with it. See where it goes, okay? Now, before I do any drawing, um, for you guys today, I thought that I would pull out a little book I made uh, quite a long time ago, back in like 2011 maybe. Um, my God, is that 10 years ago? These, this is a little small uh, book of small drawings that I made for a gallery uh, that used to exist in Portland called Half Dozen Gallery. And um, these are just all ink wash drawings. And we made a little book out of them at the, about the same size that I made the drawings. And so you can kind of just see some of the techniques that I was displaying before on slightly more finished drawings than you're gonna see from me. And you can see that you kind of work in different series of gray, but also considering things like negative space, areas that you're not drawing, but that you're leaving gaps for can become very important to you if you if you are you know in, leaning in that direction. And you can kind of see some of the technique that I'm using. So here's a wet on wet down here. There's a lot of wet on dry up here. There's a little bit of dry brush right there. So I'm just kind of bouncing through some of the same methods that we just went over. But I, you can see that I'm trying to take quite a lot of care in the illustrations of each of these spaces. Um, but I'm also allowing them to stay quite painterly, right? Let's go back to those flowers. That's a pretty good indicator of where I'm going with. So some of the flowers, like this mum right here, I'm spending a little bit of time on. But look, these, I'm basically just getting a blob of a shape and then using the wet on wet to do some of the work for me. I'm spending a lot of time on my values inside of the, the clear jar, and then I'm kind of moving on, okay? So hopefully that'll kind of give you a couple of uh, ideas for how you might want to work with this method. Um, and now I'm gonna uh, set my drawing paper up to um, make a quick drawing. I'm not gonna try and keep you, we've already been here for 20 some odd minutes. I'm gonna only kind of get this one really started but I'll show you the drawing I was planning on working from today, the image. Um, now, uh, I'm not gonna look at the photo this time. My actual, what you're seeing, those flowers are right, uh, <laughs> right there. So I'm gonna look that way at them and just start to kind of manipulate a little bit and get a little bit of work done on getting these things started so that you can kind of see how I'll go about it. Now, as you work, you know, I'm asking you to spend you know, around two hours per object. So one other thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is really regularly keep your brush clean. So you're gonna to want to uh, wash it out. You can totally clean out your water jar, your, your pure water jar uh, regularly if you need to. Now, like I said, I'm gonna try and do this somewhat quickly, which means it might be a bit more haphazard than I like. Now, because ink is ultimately very unforgiving, right? Whatever mark I put down on the paper, I can dab it with the, with the paper towel and I can try my best at cleaning it up, um, but it's, you know, it's ink on white paper, so you're gonna see it. So that's why what I'm gonna start with to begin with is my lightest black tone. And you might not even see this all that well. And I'm gonna start just by looking at 
that glass there and get a couple of marks down for it. I want a fair amount of wet here to start so that I can push some things around. And because I'm working so lightly to start, I'm not super worried about getting things exactly right because when I go back over them with a darker form later, I can probably convince the viewer um, of where I want them to look rather than them looking at like my mistake. So I am, you know, measuring with my eyes, I'm looking at things and I'm trying to get the, the general shape of my, um, of my glass in close to the right form. And then I'm gonna start, let's see that, that white daisy needs to probably be around here. And I'm gonna go ahead and mark off kind of a simple space for that. Something kind of like that, good enough. Doesn't have to be exact. In fact, it can't be right now because I'm still just kind of figuring things out. And again, I'm working faster than I think I normally would, but I want you guys to be able to watch this at close to real speed and have an idea of the method that I would use for drawing this particular object. Now, there's a lot of distance here to that outside edge of that form, and I think it's gonna work out okay for me, but I'm gonna get a quick measurement. It looks like it's about the same width of my flower and I can see that my, what I'm looking at is pretty different than your um, image. I'm looking at the flower and it's quite perked up so it's much higher on the surface. That's probably after I um, re-wet these flowers it kind of lifted up a little bit. So you're just gonna have to trust me on these distances I guess. Okay. Good enough, as they say. All right, now I'm still working in my really light um, tones, but before too long, I'm gonna want to start to work with some of my darks so that I know what my scale is actually going to be at my, my, my value range. If I stay with all my lights only for a really long time, and then I dive into my darks, what's gonna happen is I'm really quickly gonna look like I just dropped like a, a black hole into my paper. So I wanna get a little bit of wet, black, darker ink in there. This is still pretty medium gray. It looks black compared to what I was just doing, but, um, and I'm gonna get my darkest mark. Um, and I'm what, what you can't quite see uh, just off camera is I'm constantly, tapping my uh, brush on a piece of uh, paper towel so that I can kind of control where that's going. And I'm gonna come in and just blast a couple little dark lines there. And I'm also gonna use that to get that in there. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this, I think. Um, get a little bit more. And really like those leaves. <clears throat> and I like using, you know, a, a variety of marks as I work, and I like to let the ink do some of the work for me. And I think that that's one of the real tricks of being a painter or, or an, um, drawing an ink or anything that's really unforgiving. This is also true of charcoal, by the way. I think those of you who are less comfortable with charcoal, it's because you're, you spend all your time trying to force the charcoal to do what you want. And yeah, that's what we're trying to do, but we're also gotta let the charcoal do what the charcoal's gonna do. And that means it's going to be dark. It's gonna, um, it's gonna smear. Uh, it's erasable, but not perfectly erasable. And you're just gonna have to kind of deal with some of that as you work. And I want you to think of these forms similarly. Like, 
I may not be able to perfectly control this the way I could with a pencil, but it also gives me something that a pencil would not, which is a little bit of spontaneity. So like I love in this glass right here where there's all this bending of the reflection of one into the next. And I really want to use that to my advantage. So I'm gonna kind of jump into that right here. And I love how this um, stem splits in my line of sight into multiple stems as it fragments through that glass. And I'm gonna let that happen. One other move that I like to do is sometimes if you, if you dry off your brush a little bit, you can come back into a wet area and pull a little bit out with your brush and kind of control that. But of course, you can also dab. I think that's a little dark, so don't forget to dab from time to time. That cast shadow um, on the top of the box, really, really useful for me in kind of grounding this very ethereal, kind of airy, watery form that I'm dealing with. And so really, really useful. Now you can see that I made it darker away from the glass, so that's the wrong direction. So I'm tapping that off a little bit. Give it a little tappy. It's a Billy Madison reference for them. Sorry, Happy Gilmore reference for those of you who didn't know how old I was. Okay. And you can see how this is starting to kind of shape up, starting to look a little bit more like a glass, I think. But you can also see where some of my marks are probably too light. And that's good. At this stage, I want them to be fairly light. I want to be able to work them back into position across my forms as I go and kind of find what I'm looking for. You know I'm a big fan of working from the general to the specific, so that's how I'm working on this, even though I have to be pretty precise with my choices because it's ink, I also want to be able to allow myself to kind of make some, you know, screw up a little bit. One nice thing about ink is that it's transparent when you work it with water. And sometimes even just the straight black has some transparency to it as well. And that means that if you put a mark down, you can draw back across that mark and still see what your forms were meant to look like before you made that mark, which can be very useful, um, especially if you're kind of screwing some things up or, or making some moves where you weren't sure where things wanted to go and you're still just trying to figure out all your various forms. You can draw back across them. Let's get a little work done on that little flower up there. I think this is looking pretty good, generally speaking. I like it. And let's get a little bit of time on that flower. I like that I'm using the negative space, the, the white of the paper, to let this little flower start to take shape and to have a little bit of like glow to it. And I'm gonna try and maintain that as I work. So I'm looking at the shadows in the petals more than the light of the petals. And I'm trying to let that be some of the area. That 
it starts to take a little bit more shape across the rest of the form. So I want to kind of establish a couple of little shifts in depth so that it can kind of feel like there's layers of those petals back there. And I don't want to draw every single petal, okay? So like, and I don't want to draw every tiny little bit of, of, um, of um, pollen that I see in there. I just want, for me, I want the ink to be exciting. I want the mark making to be exciting. <laughs> and I want the, um, the general shapes of the flower to be what kind of inspires me to make the marks that I'm making more than that I want that individual flower to do, to look exactly like what I see in the photograph or whatever. Uh, you might've heard me say this before in this class, but I'm not a super big fan of drawings or paintings that look exactly like the photograph, like a photograph. Like I feel like the photograph already exists, you know? I, I love really detailed work, don't get me wrong, but I like drawings to look like drawings and I like um, paintings to look like paintings. And I want there to be some some liveliness to the things that I'm looking at and for there to be some sense as they work that there's a material at play, um, that there's a substance that you are looking to control as best you can as you work. And in this case, that substance, of course, is Sumi ink. And so I want this to feel like a Sumi ink drawing. I don't want to try and, I mean, I don't even know if I could use Sumi ink on straight white paper to make like a perfectly, you know, rendered form, but I could probably get it pretty, you know, pretty tightly rendered if I really was focusing on it. But like, that's not my goal here. My goal here is to look at the shapes and to let the ink do some of the work for me and to try and make an interesting drawing. An interesting drawing doesn't mean that it looks like a photograph, right? It doesn't have to mean that. It can mean that it looks like something I want to look at, like something that has some poetry to it, um, that maybe asks some questions. So one of my favorite things about working with a brush on paper is the ability that you can have to press and pull off into a really graceful position. So I'm gonna do that a few times here and there to just kind of give that sense a little bit. And notice that we're really kind of losing the far side of this daisy because there's not a lot of, it's kind of white on white. So I'm gonna darken that um, stem quite a bit. Grab that up to there. And then when I hit this other flower, I want this one to stand out a little bit more. I want it to be a little bit on the darker side. So I'm gonna use my medium gray instead of my light gray for most of my mark making for this one. And I'm gonna start by just really throwing down. I don't want it to be so invisible as the last one. And I think that the contrast between the really visible one and the really kind of invisible one will make for an interesting set of decisions. So I'm really just trying to kind of look at the edges of the, of the petals and the shadows that they create, casting down onto one another. And I'm cutting myself some slack here. You know, if I get it a little wrong, so be it. And I want you to do the same thing. I want you to, to, to act with bold decision making. And I had a painting professor in undergrad named George Hughes. Uh, George is a great painter, very abstract, very fun, very exciting uh, guy, very um, active. He would come in in the morning and he would say, you know, he had this Ghanaian, Ghanaian uh, accent. He's from Ghana. And he would say, you know, I hope you are excited to paint today. I've been up all night painting. And, and you know, that energy, knowing that he was up all night painting, was super exciting. And it made us like want to work hard. And, and he, he gave some advice in a drawing class where he said, you must fake, um, you must fake confidence until you earn confidence, kind of fake it till you make it right. And I think that if this is your first time to ever draw in ink, you're going to need to fake it. It's not easy. 
Nobody's claiming it is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're going to have to try your best to make to have some fun with it. Use what you do know. You may not know how to draw an ink, but you do know a lot of things about drawing by now. You know how to make shapes look like themselves. You know how to measure. You know how to um, uh, use value and mark making across a, a surface. You know how to look at something and determine how big the distance is from one part to another. You know how to make a composition interesting. So use all that to your advantage. Don't just, you know, try and make something that's like exact. And if you don't get it, be mad at yourself and then stop working. Like you can also spend some real time just playing. And that's why I want you to work on your um, sketchbook prompts first. Spend some time practicing some of the simple mark makings that you can do in ink before you dive into the tough stuff, okay? Again, I would normally let this whole blossom um, dry a little bit, and then I would maybe come back in. So in lieu of that, I'm just gonna tap it, knock some of the excess off, and then I'm gonna get another layer of light gray and kind of knock that down a touch so that it's not quite so much white. And you can see how the translucency of one tone of ink over another does really help to create some depth. bit more line work to kind of look at in there so I'm gonna kind of work some edges just kind of play a little bit make a few more bolder choices Been pretty wishy-washy with this one and I want a few more decisions to kind of stand out as, as kind of gutsy you know things that risk the drawing a little bit I like looking for that in, in my own work and, and in others work you know, where, where did you take a risk? And so I'm just gonna grab a few of the little dark areas and really kind of make them a little bolder and use some line weight. I like that little bleed I got there. Let's tap that out, try and keep that safe. good I think you're on the right track with any drawing if you go like while you're working on it you're like yeah not not bad <laughs> you know yeah not bad that'll work like if you make yourself laugh if I make myself laugh while drawing I know I'm like kind of onto something like oh yeah that's kind of funny um, so you know you got to look for those little moments for yourself what 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 stands out to you as a maker what makes you happy that you were working on this drawing. And I think I'm gonna to start to call this one done for now. Like I said, I want you guys to not try and draw specifically like me. I don't think that's really doable when it comes to pen and ink. I think that what you're going to be doing is ultimately finding for yourself the forms that you are most interested in drawing from. And you're gonna use those to create an image that is based on, that's like influenced by the objects that you've that you've chosen for yourself. You know, so go go to your collections, look at all the cool stuff that you have, or that your parents have, or that your roommates have, and find stuff that catches your eye. If if it excites you, 
there's a good chance it'll excite me. You know, don't don't pick really simple forms this time. You know, not not a book. You know, a closed book that's boring. You know, if you do a, if you do a book, you need to definitely do all the text on the book. Um, don't do a soccer ball or something like that. Like that's boring. That's a, that's a basic shape. That's a sphere. You know, instead of that, spend some time really making some choices about how to um, to deal with some of the difficulties that are going to come your way by working in this method. And believe me, I know the difficulties are going to happen. So you're going to be like, you know, Grant, you, this is too hard. <laughs> and it's like, no, man, it needs to be fun. It's fun. It, it is hard, but it's also really cool. So, like, have some fun with it. You know what I mean? Hi, kitty. Okay, I think I'm going to start to stop here. And I hope that by watching this, you've got some ideas of how to get started and what you might want to be working on in your own project. And as you run into snags, as you run into questions, please, please, please reach out to me. Happy to meet with you on Zoom or to have a conversation uh, via email about how to work next and what you might be most interested in. So if you're struggling, don't struggle alone, okay? You can always ask me for help um, and ideas and we can try and work on it together, okay? So that ought to do it for right now. Thank you so much for uh, attending this live stream. Um, I will uh, be online later in the afternoon, so if you have any questions or concerns, comments, or anything like that, please just let me know, all right? And the next time, until next time, friends, take care.